Hello and welcome to the World Hatchery Forum, a webinar series focused on practical solutions for hatchery managers. Through four webinars, the series will discuss fish and shrimp feeds and genetics, as well as recent equipment and technology innovations. My name is Lucia Barreiro, editor of Hatchery Feed and Management, and I will be your moderator. Today is the second in the series focused on shrimp hatcheries and we'll discuss feeds, genomic tools and breeding, breeding strategies. Today's webinar is sponsored by Cargill and the Center of Aquaculture Technologies. Each speaker will give a 15 minute presentation and then we will get to a final panel session to answer questions from the audience. To submit a question, please type it in the Q&A box. Special thanks to our assistant editor and webinar manager, Marisa Yanaga, for making all things work. And let's start with the first speaker, Jeff Petters. Jeff has more than 25 years of experience in shrimp nutrition and larvae culture. He graduated in biology from the University of Alicante and received training in, nutrition, in shrimp nutrition at the University of Ghent. He began his professional career at Fenaim Espol Research Station in Ecuador, when he has collaborated with several international companies in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Latin America focusing on the, the development of formulation of shrimp larval and on growing feed and advising aquafeed manufacturers, hatcheries and farmers. Eight years ago, he joined Biomar as a researcher dedicated to the nutrition of crustacean larvae. Today, he is global product manager of products of shrimp larvae at Biomar. The title of his presentation is Practical and Economic Advantages of Using fast Grow Feeds in Shrimp Larvae Culture. Jeff, hand it over to you. Okay, everybody can see my uh, my screen. Okay. Not yet. So let, no, you can't see my screen. I oh, know I have to share my screen first. Now you should be seeing my screen. Yeah, it's okay now. Okay. Good. Um, so good morning to everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about. Let me see. Okay. About an extension of the presentation that I gave uh, last year. Last year, I gave a presentation about uh, the fast growth feeds and how we got there. So I'm going to start there as a starting point, and I'm going to try to explain a little bit uh, how we came there. So we have the fast growth feeds. Uh, we have the introduction. So the introduction will be bridging the presentation of last year with today's, pre with today's presentation. Then uh, I will highlight some advantages and a bit of background on some aspects of the fast growth itself. Then uh, fast growth, where we get bigger PL, what are the advantages of that? Bigger PL, a lot of time also means more robust PL. So let's also look a bit at what, that's, what advantages that might bring. PL quality overall, and we'll shortly touch on some health aspects. So uh, fast growing uh, larvae, uh, fast growth in a larvae is not something that we have to take for granted. So uh, it is a potential which is there uh, and which we have to carefully look for and uh, foment, so try to provoke. As everybody knows, so you've seen this in the biology class. So we have a phenotype, which is the expression of the gene. So how an individual grows in this in this uh, special occasion. So do we have fast growth in the phenotype, which will depend on its genetics, on its genotype. It will depend on its environment. And then there's an aspect that actually is part of the environment, but in culture, we can take out of the environment because we can control it much better, which is the nutrition. And of course, my talk will go on, on, on that one. Um, does this work? Yes, it does work. So uh, we, we see that between last year, where, for example, I presented the results of one hatchery, now we see that a big part of the Ecuadorian hatcheries are already using fast growth feeds. So last year, I presented uh, these results uh, where the genetic uh, Part was taken care of by the Universidad de La Palma de Gran Canaria, 
where the management part uh, was taken care of by Biochemar in Aquarian Hatchery and where the nutrition part was taken care of by us. Um, you see here a uh, graph. It's actually a total length weight graph done, uh, drawn up in 2010, published in the Swim book. And um, there we see the relationship between total length and weight. I've put, an, put in a second axis of something that we use a lot in Ecuador, which is how many PLs per gram. So if the animals weigh two milligrams, we will have 500 PLs per gram. Traditionally uh, in Ecuador, uh, larvae, they were harvested at PL12. So around here and PL12 would be somewhere between 250 and 300 PLs per gram. Now, what did we observe last year? So with genetics, with a good management and advanced management and with nutrition, we were getting animals in a PL9 stage. So animals of nine days old, which were not around 250 gram, 250 animals per gram, but which arrived at 180 animals per gram. So this means uh, we got a nine day old post larvae uh, that arrived at 180 animals per gram. So meaning we get bigger PL in a shorter time. So uh, in this case, up to six days earlier that we got these larvae. So really, so a genetic uh, selection, a good management, and then combined with a good nutrition can unlock this fast growth potential in shrimp larvae. Again, exact, actually the, the, the same data, uh, this is data from larvae. So there we see the growth of this particular hatchery. And then this is, uh, the, and we see it against the growth in the rest of the country. And this is actually in a kind of real time because these measurements are made by an application where everybody every day puts in his growth through a picture taken on the mobile phone. So uh, what happens? So we have a shorter cycle, which actually means we can have more cycles per year. Uh, we see that uh, in the first scenario, so the old scenario where we have a growth cycle of 21 days and where we harvest the PLs, uh, 12, uh, PL12, 12 day old PLs at 250 animals per gram. Another scenario where we, where, where we have the same, so it's a new reality, where we harvest the animals in 15 days, so the whole hatchery cycle 15 days, where we harvest uh, uh, BLs at nine days of age, age at 180 animals per gram. Now let's, uh, let's assume that we, put, uh, that we produce 10 million animals per cycle and that, and that we have an X hatchery sales price of around $3.5 per 1,000. Of course, this sales price will vary according to the region, but it's just to give an example. So we have our harvest uh, sizes, uh, 250 animals per gram, 180. The cycle duration, uh, 28. This differs from the 21 because I'm counting there a seven day cleaning and dry out period, very important, of course, in the hatchery cycle, which means that we can, in the first case, that we were having 13 uh, hatchery cycles per year compared in the new reality with 17 hatchery cycles per year, quite a bit more animals uh, produced and quite a bit more sales. So like 30% more sales per year by using genetics, a good management and fast growth feeds. Um, so that was one of the first advantages. Let's see a little bit what goes into, so what exactly goes into this fast, uh, fast growth feed? We go high protein and in this high protein, what kind of high protein we use? Easily digestible peptides because we're, we're really working with animals where the digestive system is still in development. It is in development, it is a changing environment, a changing digestive system. So we need a lot of protein. Remind that uh, uh, shrimp preferentially use protein both for their energy needs as for the building blocks of their, of their uh, body. So we're looking at animals which are going growing 15 to 20 percent per day. So we need a lot of building blocks. We need a lot of lot of little Lego blocks for this animal to build this animal together to make it grow. Then specialized lipid formulation very important for to make robust animals and also for growth. So phospholipids, phospholipid classes, which kind of phospholipids have to monitor our cholesterol levels and then of course also our essential fatty acids. Um, some more, of course, we can't forget about the vitamins, minerals, uh, 
pigments and antioxidants like astaxanthin. And then of course, there's loads of forgotten nutrients that, that we don't see, but that we also have to take care of in our fast growth feeds. It's not just about putting stuff in there, it is also about balancing nutrient ratios. That is why it is called, uh, in Spanish, we call this feed a balanceado, because we really balance our nutrient ratios and it is really majorly important. And of course, there are specialty ingredients, which, for example, we might use in order to boost our immune uh, competence. So uh, doing this, we can really unlock the, the the power of these uh, of, of, of the, these fast growing feeds, taking care, especially in formulating for to facilitate molds and metamorphosis, and also optimizing our health status. So uh, bigger PL2 faster growth, how do we come to higher health? So if you look at the bottom, you can see counting calories, the cost of inflammation which comes from an article from one in 2019 in cell. So Actually, what actually we are going to see here that uh, a disease or even the immune system costs a lot of calories. So here we have an animal in its uh, normal situation. We see all the resources, uh, the energy resources that the animal is dedicating to uh, different processes. So we see quite a bit of uh, dedicated to growth. Some later on will be dedicated to reproduction, not yet. And then we have about, this can go up to 30%, can be uh, dedicated to maintaining a basal immune system. Now, what happens if you put this animal in an adverse environment? Then suddenly these resources, which have to be mobilized for uh, defending against disease or being in a stressful environment, they can go up to 60 and more percent. So all this energy, which is used for, uh, uh, in, uh, disease defense is not being used for growth. So uh, meaning that a healthy larvae uh, needs to have its immune uh, parameters uh, good, good uh, true nutrition where we can do it. And secondly, this also means that if we have a post larvae at eight days post larvae, which has attained a growth of 180 animals per gram, has not needed to uh, put any uh, expense, any energy on disease resistance. So it means that all the energy has gone to growth, which means that this post larvae has been a healthy post larvae, has been a healthy larvae in all of its life up until that point. So two important points. These I just put for completeness. Uh, you can look it up in the paper if you want, but not for making my point. Another advantage that we have, less falling. So. Uh, you all know it, if you work in hatcheries, you can have falling, falling, which is like um, epiphytes and epibions living on top of the carapace of the shrimp. So here we have some filamentous bacteria, filamentous algae, which are on the, on the shrimp and which kind of are, are not good, uh, hinders the animal in its movement. And for example, you also have epi, epizones, in this case, a kind of epistilis, uh, maybe small uh, rotifers living, living on the shrimp carapace, which of course is not good, and which our client, if he notice this, will not accept the larvae. Now what happens if you have a fast growth, that means we have a higher molt frequency. So the molt, molting comes much more frequent, which means we have much less falling on our larvae or actually no falling. So that means we get nice and clean larvae, which will be, uh, uh, which will be appetizing for our buyers. Here I've taken some survey results. We're going to talk about robust, robustness now. I'm taking some survey results from a uh, presentation from Eva Werkhoek in 2017. Eva works for the competition, but she made a very nice presentation here on this survey. Um, this survey is about the larvae. So what do you think? So this is perception of the people. So do you think that a good hatchery protocol, so including feed, that you will get a good results afterwards in a nursery phase? And everybody in this, in this uh, survey responded, yes. The same was asked, they asked the same to uh, in the growth out phase. And they all responded that yes, improved hatchery protocols will have a beneficial, aspect in the a beneficial um, effect in the growth out phase. And uh, not only is it your impression, but you also have re results that confirm this finding. And the biggest, big, a big part of respondents 
they responded that yes, they can confirm these findings. So this is very important. So we know that a good quality larvae will have lasting effects afterwards also in the growth phase. Some effects, so let's see some effect of nutritional stress test where survival. This was an article published by Jean-Francois Rees in 94 already, old article, but still uh, very actual. So what he did here was uh, feed larvae with different uh, concentrations of UFA and look at the stress test response, at a salinity stress test re response. You can see here that at high levels of UFA, that the mortality to a salinity stress test was low. And the less UFA we include, the higher the mortality becomes. And where we don't include any UFA, we got a very high cumulative mortality. Now what happens? So exactly what I've explained, more UFA, less mortality. So what this means, it is another graph from the same publication where we have survival to an osmotic stress at PL10. So what a 10 day old post larvae, they do uh, survival at osmotic stress. And we see here the final survival at PL15. And we can easily see that at a low survival to an osmotic stress, sorry, to a low survival to an osmotic stress, we get a low final survival at PL15. And the other way around, if we get a high survival at an osmotic stress, we get a high survival at PL15. So the same, this is a publication from NICE, Nassens, from Eddie Nassens in 95. What he did here, he uh, tested counter currents. This is actually a very fun thing to play with. I've also had the occasion to play with this setup. So you submit the larvae to a counter current stress, the water goes through the tube, you put some water at the beginning of the tube and you see how long they resist swimming against the current. And then you catch the larvae which come out of the tube after 10 minutes, 20, uh, 20 minutes, and you will see how they come out and how good this batch of larvae resist stress. And actually, so what he saw was, and what I also saw was that um, if you actually do this, and we also did a stress test on this, you see that animals that resist best, bet, better a osmotic stress and also which are very fit to swim against a countercurrent, so robust larvae, that they also, also afterwards they grow to a bigger size. So uh, in practice, practical conditions in Vietnam, where we're rearing, for example, with fast growth feeds, what happens with the stress test survivals? So in Vietnam, where we're rearing PL10 to free PL1 to PL10s with fast growth feed. We've, we saw that with the fast growth feeds, of course, we got a faster growth, but also we got a bigger survival to a stress test. This stress test was quite a big stress test. This was a 19 hour lasting uh, stress test. So the animals were exposed to a low salinity during 19 hours. And we got a better survival than other feeds which were not optimized for fast growth. The same in Ecuador, where we reared from now PI5 to PL12, 12 day old post larvae with fast growth feeds. We see the same, more bands tested, uh, so a higher wet weight, and also at the same time, a higher resistance to a salinity stress test. This was a short salinity stress test, only one hour. So salinity stress test as a predictor, these are actually data from a uh, hatchery in uh, Ecuador. This was the Aquatexa hatchery in two, around 2000. And they also had a farm from the same group, which is called Dipsa. So what happened here? Um, so here we saw these were the results. So survival to a stress test in the x-axis and survival in shrimp farms afterwards. So the nice part of these data was we could work with the data from the hatchery and with the data from the farm afterwards. And what did we see? Uh, what did we see? These are data from uh, Julio, Julio Macias. What we see with the data from, uh, from Julio was that he was shipping his larvae always at higher than 90% survival in a stress test. So that was when the larvae was shipped. But occasionally when the larvae had to go to the hatchery and they didn't have any 90% survival larvae, they would ship 80% survival larvae. So what did we see here? That survival higher than 90% did not really uh, guarantee a lot because of course we have a lot of variation also from the environment in the, in the, in the farm, from the, the, the weather, the soil preparation, transport, so lots of other factors. 
which apart from the larval quality are taking place. But what did we also see? There were no data here, meaning there's no data where survival, a low survival at a stress test gave a high survival at the shrimp farm. So these data were absent. So this is clearly telling you something. So in short, about robustness, we have fast growth nutrition. On, so unlocking the fast growth potential, we get big and robust post larvae, and we get good growth and survival potential in the nursery or in the farm. So this is the resume of the past five slides. Um, I'm going to go a bit, so what is this fast growing effect in the hatchery? How, does this have an effect also afterwards in the farm? So the fast growth, not only the survival. Everybody knows the concept of homeostasis, uh, 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 graphically representing it. Homeostasis can be like a little, a little bowl, which is in a, in a little pit, in a little valley. What happens if we put the bowl out of its equilibrium, so we push it up the side of the wall, so if we release the ball, it will go back to its steady state at the bottom of the valley, and it will always go back to this, uh, to this steady state. So this is homeostasis, or this kind of inertia, a kind of willingness of this ball to remain static and to go back to the, to the previous uh, uh, situation. Now, we can have the same, we can imagine the same with two balls, but the two balls are at different heights. heights. So for example, if you push this ball, this will go to a lower height, uh, will return to a lower height. If we push this ball up, it will return to a higher height. So there is a uh, difference there. So going from homeostasis, we go to homo homeoresis or the growth inertia, which is because our shrimp, we don't want our growing shrimp to go back to the same state as before, because that was before growing. If uh, in our shrimp growth, we put them out of their equilibrium. We want to get them to go back to their growth, right? So we, we put them out of their equilibrium, the, the blue arrow. We want to go them back to their, to their growth, which actually they do within limits. So what happens if we have a higher growth, but we also want, if we have a higher growth rate, we want the same. We want that our animals, if they grow like this, then they return to the growth. We can see this again in the graph that I shown before, where at a lower growth rate, the larvae will be grown to, to a lower growth rate, but we actually want is this homeoresis. So this homeoresis is actually a willingness of the animal to remain in the same growth, even if the growth is perturbed for one or the other environmental factor during mold. This actually was also stated by uh, Siegler, a nice graph that he made. So we have an expected growth of shrimp, and uh, we can see we, see, we see a perturbation and we see that the animal wants to go back to a growth, but which doesn't always go back because of an altered physiology. Now of an altered physiology, why can this be? Because we are working with very small animals. We are working with animals that mold and that metamorphosize. We are working with animals that rearrange their cells completely at every mold and at every metamorphosis. We are, work, uh, we are working with animals that have a very high hormone function and regulation going on. So if we disrupt this growth, this hormone regulation in early stages where the animal is being rearranged, then of course we will irreversibly damage our animal's growth capacity if we give feeds of a quality which are not uh, made for fast growing up. Again, some more rationale. This was uh, from a uh, chapter from, from Masiki Brzezinski in 2018, so quite, uh, quite recent, where they see that uh, at a food limitation, that you see a serious redu reduction in, uh, in uh, body size. And here they say it, so what is a reduced food supply? So this is the quantity of food, a reduced food, food supply can delay maturity and reduce somatic growth. And this also happens in decapods. So not only in Daphnia, but it also happens in decapods. They also say something about the food quality and they say that exactly the same happens. So the food quality will also have an effect. And here I haven't underlined it, but crustaceans fit a diet of inadequate quality. So not made for fast growth, 
will grow more slowly and mature later at a smaller body size. So again, a confirmation of what we have seen before. In summary, what I have talked about, so now I will summarize what, some of the aspects I have talked about, and maybe I will also touch on some other ones. I am limited in time, so I couldn't go into detail of all the aspects. So we are having fast growing larvae, which will result in big animals, big, robust and strong animals, and that will be healthy, which will be our advantage for the hatchery. Fast growing, it's very, very easy, shorter cycles, more cycles per year, more money to be made, very easy. Big animals, and although they are big, we are seeing also a reduction in size variation or a not, we are not seeing a big size variation as we expect. This might be due to the feeds, but is also completely under management in Ecuador. So we can uh, control our size variation. And big animals are also resulting, we are seeing in some of the hatchery in a higher post larvae price, up to 10% higher price for these big, robust uh, post larvae. Robust, strong. Robust and strong animals will mean that in situations of stress, we will have more survival. Healthy PL will mean that in, so in situations of disease, of a disease challenge, we will have a, a higher survival. Now, these two, what do they signify? This means that we have a constancy, we have a predictable production. This means if you have a constant survival in your, in your uh, hatchery cycles, you know that your next hatchery cycle, you will have a predictable production, which means that you can plan your production. You can call to the farm. You can say at that day, I will have uh, that so many PLs at that size, which is an incredible advantage in your logistics in your hatchery. These three, of course, these three, these uh, size, small size variation, uh, big PL and uh, survival potential, is of course a big aspect of the quality, important for the hatchery, but also important for the nursery, the farm where your animals are going. There comes into play the hemorrhoiosis where we talked about, so which is the fast growth potential, which is there in the animals, which has been kept up to level uh, when the animals arrive at the farm. We have bigger animals, means if you have bigger animals, it means we have a shorter cycle, but for the few days that it means in, in a uh, farm, I'm not going to extend too much on these ones. We will have robust, strong, uh, strong post larvae, a good survival in transport acclimation in the nursery, and the healthy post larvae will uh, uh, accentuate the immune status of the animals. So in short, I think in this, the three important aspects that we have here is we have a shorter cycle in the hatchery, a constant and a predictable production of quality post larvae. So I think, so uh, these are three important aspects of having fast growing larvae. So uh, true nutrition, and if possible, also to uh, genetics, and also very important to management. I thank you very much uh, for listening to my presentation and I'll give way to the next speaker. Thank you, Jeff. Great presentation and great results. Our next speaker is Ricardo Cedeño. Ricardo holds a bachelor degree in aquaculture from Higher Polytechnic School of Littoral in Guayaquil. He completed postgraduate studies at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. He was part of Thenaim Research Station, where he developed extensive marine research focused on shrimp immunology and microbiology. Later, he held positions in multinational companies such as Bayer and Inve as a commercial technical representative in shrimp farms. At Cargill, Ecuador, he currently is a specialist in shrimp farms, developing liquid diet lines in the country. Title of his presentation is Liquid Fits, Nutrition Meets Technology to Maximize Productive Results in Hatcheries. Ricardo, hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm I talking from Ecuador, uh, from Cargill, Ecuador. Uh, uh, as mentioned, Lucia will talk about liquid fit and the technology used for to produce it. Okay. Uh, we, all we know, the global industry of the string and the production on a global scale has been uh, impacted in the last decades, uh, mainly due to sanitary issues like the DNS in the 20s, 13, and more recently, the COVID 19 pandemic in the last. Uh, 
two or three years. Uh, but uh, at this, uh, uh, this moment, the, the industry has been recovered from, uh, and is, uh, we have a very good estimation of growth uh, for the next four years. Uh, we are expecting the, to reach uh, over 11% of the increase in, in the uh, annual growth rate, uh, reaching uh, 4.8 metric million of metric tons as stream produced in the 2025 year. So uh, um, uh, all this uh, growth of the industry has to be uh, uh, supported uh, with a, a, a stable supply of uh, healthy post larvae uh, to be aligned with the projected demand of in the next years. Um, the strategy that will allow us uh, to sustain this uh, uh, growth in both in quantity and in quality is uh, supported by three main pillars like nutrition, biosecurity, and genetics. Uh, nutrition, uh, we have uh, to be able to supply the, the required feed for each specific uh, stage in the stream development. Um, um, the required application of this, uh, uh, of the most advanced technology to produce uh, fits with a consistent quality. Uh, uh, as, as was mentioned previously, uh, we need to unlock the genetic potential of the animals, optimizing growth and health. The biosecurity, uh, we need uh, to have uh, production systems. Uh, it has to be designed uh, to minimize the risk of disease outbreaks in the production cycles. And the genetics, uh, uh, we have to invest in programs, uh, genetic programs uh, has to be implemented to obtain the strains or of selected animals with higher growth rates or with uh, some characteristics like disease resistance to specific pathogens. Uh, in Cargill, our vision is to promote the, the use of uh, these uh, new uh, feeds in replacement and partial total replacement of traditional dry feeds use it. Uh, in order to do so, uh, Cargill is uh, working with the continuous evaluation of the available technologies in the development of formulas for larval reading. Through our red lip nutrition program, always uh, we are looking uh, to develop efficient solutions to attend the needs of our customers, both in stream hatcheries and also in, in nurseries. No? Uh, we have um, many technologies uh, to produce uh, fits, and uh, one of these is the microencapsulation technology. Uh, what is this? This is uh, it's a technology of packaging, uh, solids or liquid or, or even gas. Uh, it's not a new technology. Uh, we have a reference from the application of this uh, methodology in the early 30s. Uh, we're using to produce raw materials in the paper industry. Uh, this technique has some characteristics like uh, the, we can get uh, some micro that, that protects the, the, the content and also can be uh, re, the content can be released uh, under some specific uh, conditions so we can control the the slow uh, release of the uh, uh, product that we want to uh, deliver to the animals later uh, uh, there are new applications in different industries such as pharmaceutical, chemical, agricultural, and in feeds and cosmetics. Uh, the microcapsules uh, particles are generally manufactured in a range from one to 1,000 micrometers. And Cargill is working uh, for more than, than 25 years ago with these uh, uh, technologies implemented to use the microcapsulation into the formulation of our liquid feeds uh, for the market. Uh, there are many microcapsulation techniques available in the, in the market now, um, and mainly segmented uh, uh, in two groups uh, according to the specific uh, process required by each industry. We have uh, uh, two groups uh, like uh, uh, the che using chemical methods to produce microcapsules and mechanical methods to use uh, to produce it. Uh, each one of these methodologies has his, his 
his characteristics and uh, some complexities and costs associated uh, to each one. So uh, there are many in many industrial applications uh, in different industries like textile, uh, cosmetic, uh, pharmacy, medicine, agriculture, and uh, of course in food industries where, where, is, uh, where we are working actually with, to produce the feeds uh, for the spring post -lark. Okay, the, the use of these uh, microcirculation te techniques allow it uh, carry to develop a liquid feed. Uh, all we know uh, that the, in aquatic systems is uh, the stability of the particles is essential to assure uh, uh, the right delivery of no nutrients to the animals and to avoid the impacts in the water quality. Water quality. Uh, mainly related with the process like leaching of the nutrients in the water. So with this, uh, with this uh, technique, uh, we can uh, produce uh, microcapsules uh, that protects the content. And we have uh, the protein uh, inside of the particles. We have a, a inner layer of lipid and the outer and outer layer recovering all the all the product and, the, and protecting the content. So the, uh, uh, we can deliver these uh, particles directly to the animals without affecting the quality of the aquatic environment where the animals are are, are being uh, cultured. But why why uh, liquid nutrition? Okay, uh, we know that the string. Uh, growth process uh, represent a very stressful event for post -larvae. They have to pass for all the stage of metamorphosis. And uh, we have uh, on this, post uh, all these larval uh, have a very poor developed digestive tract. So the, we require nutrients that were easily digested and absorbed by the animals. And also it's essential for liquid feed to have a, uh, uh, the right uh, particle size uh, for each stage of development of the animals. Okay, uh, what other benefit we have to use the microcasulated liquid feed? Okay, we eliminate the leaching, uh, that is uh, one of the principal problems uh, affecting the water quality in, in, the, in the culture tanks. Uh, this process of layering uh, prevents the loss of nutrients in the water, so the nutrients remain intact until the, the larvae can consume and reduce, in this way, reduce the impact on the water quality. Uh, also, the feed availability is important. Uh, the build lets uh, dis uh, disperse throughout the, the water column, maximizing the interaction between larva and feed and also increasing uh, the consumption and nutrient intake of, of the animals. This reduces the expenditure of energy of the animal looking for, for food in the, in the tank. Okay, the, the also important to mention the protocol of feeding with the liquid diets is very simple, reduce time and minimize mistakes in the, in the production uh, in the hatcheries. We have, uh, three or uh, four steps. Uh, the first measure, the recommended amount of feed is, we have to weigh the amount of feed recommended for each day, mix uh, with a small amount of water, and administer directly to the, to the tanks of culture. So uh, these uh, simple steps uh, allow uh, uh, time for the production team to to work uh, to follow up the the quality parameters in the and the production metrics to take the more agile decisions uh, uh, in the in the production process. Okay, the simplification of the production process is key for the daily management of hatcheries through uh, through Cargill's development of liquid feed. Uh, our customer has been able to reduce the number of uh, diet usage uh, within the production stage. Uh, normally, uh, in a, as an example, we have a, a, a protocol using between 12 to 14 diets for the entire cycle. And with the use of the, our protocols, we can reduce uh, the number of three to three or four diets for all the cycle of production. 
simplifying all the operation. Okay, uh, so protein results. So through the use of microcapsulated lipid diets in replacement of traditional diets, we have been able to obtain some uh, results uh, like the better survival, better water quality parameters, um, similar or better uh, postlar big weights. Uh, we can reduce, as mentioned, the impact on water quality. Uh, uh, in this graphic, we can see the total ammonia nitrogen content in the uh, in the water. Uh, this is a graphic shows from the levels of ammonia from SOEA1 to PL10. And we have 100% a, a, a of inclusion of uh, liquid diets until uh, PL1. And after that, uh, the 70 5% of inclusion of liquid diets mixed with dry feed, and after that, only dry feed. So we can observe the impact of this change and in inclusion have in the level of ammonia in water. Uh, the, the, the upper line is the average of three tanks uh, with a regular uh, protocol. And the, uh, this line is the average of three tanks with a, a diet, uh, liquid diet, uh, it fits until PL5 at 75% of inclusion. Uh, very similar, uh, uh, we have a, 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 within the conducted trials, we can also observe the same uh, 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 similar uh, uh, trends in the ionized ammonia. Uh, it's, uh, we have a also the same levels of inclusion, 100% of the PL1, 75% um, uh, of inclusion of liquid feed until PL5. And after that, 100% uh, uh, of inclusion of, of dry feeds in the tank. In the survival, we also have a, an impact. Uh, uh, the higher inclusion of microencapsulated feeds results uh, uh, in higher survival rates amongst the trials conducted conducted in the hatcheries. So we can observe uh, a difference of uh, over 20% of, uh, of survival in the uh, tanks receiving, receiving the, the treatment of, uh, with liquid feeds, again, uh, again the tanks with the regular protocol of production. Um, the, the increase in the application of liquid feed did not have an effect, an effect on the final harvest result. Also, we, can, we were able to, to observe uh, uh, similar weights at the end of the, of the cycle, or even uh, greater uh, or higher uh, weights in the animals with the liquid diet in the protocol. Okay. Uh, uh, we know the, the projected growth of this global stream market will reflect on a higher demand of high quality stream post larvae. So uh, this expected increase calls for the maximize implementation of new technologies to maximize productive output. We need to have uh, innovative me methods to manufacture uh, high quality liquid feeds through the inclusion of new ingredients and functional additives. And the, uh, we will also need the technification of stream hatcheries through the automatization uh, of feeders, aerators, and the use of software to support the, the, the making decisions uh, to manage the production. Uh, we are expecting to increase, uh, we will see it increase the stocking density in cultures to uh, cover the, the, the demand, uh, the increase in the, in the demand of the post larvae in the future. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ricardo. Great presentation. Our next speaker is Alan Tinch. Alan is VP of Genetics at the Center for Aquaculture Technologies. He's a geneticist and animal breeding breeder for, with over 30 years of experience of working in commercial breeding programs for aquatic and terrestrial farm animals. During his career, he has introduced new technology into breeding programs to improve health, welfare, and performance. His role in the Center, of, in the Center for Aquaculture Technologies is to commercialize in genome editing in farm and aquatic species. Alan, hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, 
Okay, can everyone see that? I hope so. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, I want to talk today about uh, the collaboratively designed genomic tools um, and for their use in breeding and, and selection of uh, uh, shrimp in particular. Um, this is, uh, it has grown to be a title within our organization it's based on um, a, a famous quote from Lord of the Rings, which is, is, is one ring to rule them all. And we've come up with the, the, the title, one chip to rule them all. Uh, our objective is to develop uh, tools for genomics uh, that allow uh, users of uh, genomic technology and different species and, and aquaculture access to highly effective, highly efficient, cost-effective tools for, for breeding and genomics. Uh, the, the Center for Aquaculture Technologies, I'll refer to that as CAT, is, is a, an organization uh, with two main operations, uh, one in Canada, where we have uh, testing facilities for contract trials, uh, where we do health challenges and feed testing in many different species of, of aquatic animals. And our other operational facility is our labs and offices in San Diego, California, where uh, we develop uh, new, new technologies, particularly in gene editing uh, for use in aquaculture species. Our, um, our structure is to have services in the major technical areas of, of aquaculture all under one roof. So we have uh, technical abilities and are able to support uh, producers in, in the areas of health, nutrition, breeding, uh, genotyping, and also now genome editing. Uh, and we have uh, a strong team of technical people with expertise and experience in each of these areas that are able to provide support for uh, operations and breeding programs around the world. Just a little bit of context initially. Uh, if we look at the development of uh, production for uh, pr production of, of meat, both in terrestrial and in, uh, in water, uh, we see an increase over the last uh, five or six decades, significant increases in, in production of most species. Uh, and, and on this graph, which is, which, which is often used at the starts of these sorts of presentations, we have the major terrestrial species, pigs, cattle, um, and, 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 and chickens. Uh, and sheep, they are all represented as, as a single line. But within that, uh, we have aquaculture represented as, as, as a single area, single area on the graph. Uh, and in reality, that represents many species. The, the, the challenge, therefore, that we have is, is to develop technology uh, within a production of, of far greater number of species. So when we're developing genetic solutions generally genetic, genetic programs but also when we're developing nutrition and, and health um, um, and, and health uh, uh, products we have far less of a, a, an impact in terms of the size of the market to generate the r d that allows us to develop new technologies so we have to to learn from what other people are doing particularly in the terrestrial sector look at what is going on in the development of different technologies and use that that information to, um, to, to develop our technologies in an effective way. And I want my specialism uh, that throughout my career has been building breeding programs and I've seen a number of different new technologies coming in. Uh, all of those technologies in a breeding program are, are, are rely on a foundation, a strong foundation of biosecurity. And I think that's a, an area that I would always raise as a as a, an essential when we're putting together uh, breeding programs to make sure that we're doing that in an area of, of high biosecurity because the ability to supply clients and customers with genetics depends on, on the health status of your bridge stock. So uh, biosecurity is an essential um, uh, underpinning um, technology for, for all of the other technologies that fall. Uh, putting a breeding program together, there are many things to consider, and, and in, a, in a modern, sophisticated breeding program, uh, many of these technologies will will be in place. Uh, I put it together as, a, as, as, as an attempt to build a wall, and one of the characteristics of, of building 
uh, structures is that you have to have a strong foundation, as I said, in biosecurity. But the technologies that we're talking about are, are cumulative. They add together to make a, a stronger structure. They're interlinked. Many of the technologies we use depend on other technologies. So that, that linkage is important. And in most cases, it's important to build from the bottom up. Uh, that we, we put in place fundamental technologies, basic technologies, and we build on those uh, with more sophisticated technologies as, as they become available. And in terms of the genomic tools that we use, uh, there, there, are, there are a number of the technologies that are now commonplace and used in breeding programs for, for aquaculture species, including shrimp. There are many of these technologies that been, are based on genomics, in particular our is genomic selection, marker-assisted selection, where we're using the information that we can collect from genotyping animals uh, to make predictions about their ability to, per, to perform in particular, for particular traits, particular characteristics. And genomic selection, marker-assisted selection is, is now commonplace and, and used within terrestrial species and, and, in, and, and aquatic species. Other areas where we require genomics are areas such as um, inbreeding control and a and, uh, process we know as sub-selection where we use the information from relatives collected in a, a remote population, often under a disease challenge. We use that information uh, to tell us about the broodstock that we're selecting within our breeding program. Uh, so that's now uh, a process that's in place in many different breeding programs. But all of those uh, technologies depend also on our ability to collect good quality data. So we need to be able to measure the animal in the production environment, collect that information, link it back to its family, and use that information to uh, make the right decision as to which animals grow quickly, which animals are resistant to disease, which, is, which animals have uh, the best characteristics for production. So in terms of developing a genotyping tool, we need to have a number of different uh, characteristics. Uh, first of all, we need to have good coverage of the, the genome. So the, the, the markers that we're interested in using need to come, need to be present on all throughout the genome, uh, present on all the chromosomes. We need to be able to um, find markers that vary between individuals. Uh, we call that polymorphisms, um, where, where there, there are two different variants uh, present in the population and different animals in the population. So we need to have lots of variation uh, between the different markers on the in the panel. Uh, we have to have a reasonable level of variation uh, in, in, in terms of the, the frequency of the different markers. So many markers will have uh, a very low frequency, so a high variant and a low variant, and our, our ideal markers are, are more variable than that, typically in the range of uh, between 30 and 70 percent variation. And then, in terms of the usefulness of the the, the 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 technology, it's good if we can find genes with big effects, uh, major genes affecting uh, the, the the characteristics that we're interested in, the traits we're interested in are are now reasonably common uh, in different in different species uh, and that means that we we have identified uh, areas of the chromosome as we as we refer to them in in genetics quantitative trait loci uh, qtls meaning that there is a major gene in the population that is affecting the trait and using markers closely linked to that gene allows us to identify those individuals that have uh, the, the beneficial version of the gene so it's nice to have that in the population where that's present, but if, if, if not, we can still run genomic selection using um, technology, uh, statistical technology to make predictions about the average effect of all the different markers in individuals relative to animals that are also tested in the population. And in terms of all of these different aspects, we, we see where there are different strains in use in, in, in different parts of the, the market. Uh, it's important that, that, that our, our tools, our genomic tools are able to be able to use and be able to use in different strains, that we can use them uh, in different strains. So we may use different um, markers as part of the panel, but it, it's important that we're able to go across stream to give a, a tool that is useful for everyone in the, in the market, in the, in the breeding program market. 
typically uh, we have a come through a, 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 an environment where individual research groups have developed their own customized strains. Uh, and I think looking at the ability to do good genetics and provide services to uh, a, a, an increasingly global market, we, we, we prefer a collaborative use where the tools tend to be um, designed for multiple populations. They give good marker coverage. Uh, they're, they're in, in a situation where you've got a, a tool that's more generally applicable, then costs will be less. It's just better value uh, where we're able to do use the same uh, genetic tool to cover a different a range of different um, uh, customers. So we get economies of scale. Uh, and, and we're, we're far more able with regard broadly used tool to be able to update or bring in new technologies where, the, where, the, where that becomes available. Uh, and we, we tend to look at a process of evolution where we're moving forward with using the, uh, uh, the, the marker set we already have and then add new markers to that. That allows us to, to develop a strain with forward compatibility uh, rather than a new set of you know, steps for each strain. Um, and I think the, the overall advantage is that we, if we have a if we have a collaboratively de designed product, then many people can can access we can access it. We can offer that to a range of different clients, and there's no restriction on um, which which markers can be used by different people. As I said, it's important for us to be able to to learn from what other people are doing, and there are a number of examples where uh, species wide tools have been developed. And a good example of that is the development of, of tips for, um, for use in cattle. Uh, so that's been built on uh, successive collaborative development of, of tools over typically a three to five year period where new, new chips have come in through time. Uh, the breeding companies and the breed societies around the world have collaborated internationally to add to the development of the the, the set of uh, markers that are used in cattle. They, they're inclusive in that they welcome the use of, of different breeds. So they're, 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 they, they, even though there are major beef breeds used in particular production systems, dairy or beef, uh, they also welcome in variation from, from other more minor breeds. Uh, they're, they've gone through a process of evolution of bringing in trait-linked markers and functional SIPs. And that, that market size allows everyone to benefit from economy of scale in terms of keeping prices relatively low. In terms of salmon, um, a lot of work has been done in uh, USDA in, in terms of developing the North American Atlantic salmon uh, set of markers. And you know, that's now being used generally across Atlantic salmon strains. In, in the European strains, there's still a number of different panels in the market, uh, and that's come up through a history of different companies and research groups. Um, and, if, and I think in the, in the medium term, that market would benefit from um, consolidating around a common SNP. I think there, there's enough commonality between the major uh, panels to be able to be put together as a, as a commutative uh, uh, panel and be able to um, a collaborative approach and be used by most of the breeding companies. So in terms of what's available to the shrimp community, uh, CAT have developed uh, Aqua Ray HD for Vanami, which is a high density array. Um, it, it, has, it includes a number of functional SNPs for disease resistance. Uh, we can support the development and use of that in, in breeding programs uh, throughout uh, the shrimp production market. Um, we can customize that tool for use in particular populations. And we think that that tool is now generally available at a competitive price to our, to, our, to our customers in the market. In terms of putting it together, um, we, uh, we pulled together material from uh, the major shrimp production markets uh, and developed uh, a set of uh, markers uh, initially from a, a density of 600,000 SNPs, 600, 600k SNPs, uh, and going through an analysis across the, the different markets where SNPs are produced the different strains. Uh, we developed a 50 
uh, K SNP that, that has become generally available. It includes within it SNPs from previous panels. So there is a history of, of the evolution of, of this panel. It includes SNPs that we, uh, we are able to demonstrate that have an effect in, in different traits. There are some SNPs that are, that are used that are population specific, so particular SNPs that have, have functionality in, in particular populations we've included. And we've, we've spread the, the, the markers across the chromosomes in, a, in, in an optimal way so that the, the entire genome has coverage of, of SNPs that can be used. Um, we here. This is uh, there's more detail here about the different linkage groups, the different chromosomes, uh, cr chromosomal groups within shrimp, and the level of coverage that's covered uh, there. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because I think I'm beginning to run short of time. Um, in terms of validating the use of that SNP, we've done a number. We've used it for a number of different purposes both on a development stage and then and also now commercially. So we use it for characterization of inbreeding and relatedness within populations. We can use it for parental assignment. We can use it to look for uh, QTLs, major genes that affect the traits we're interested in, and we can use it for gen genomic selection. And it's been used in populations uh, in the major production areas um, uh, throughout the world. So USA, including USA, Ecuador, in Thailand. I think going back to where we started, this is a tool for improved selection for performance in shrimp. Uh, it's used in a number of different technologies that are now commonplace in breeding. So breeding programs for animals that are used for farming now routinely contain all of these technologies uh, and those have evolved through time and been incorporated um, in, in many different breeding programs and a large part of our business now is genotyping shrimp using uh, the panel that are described that depends that relies on people being able to collect information to use a selection so i think you know, although we're taking a, uh, an advanced approach towards breeding our animals using genomic information, we still rely very hev heavily on collecting information. That, that the, the, the most effective part of starting a breeding program is being able to reliably collect data, collect information on the animals in the program, and then that allows us to apply more sophisticated genetic and genomic techniques to the population to improve growth, survivability, and other traits. So in terms of our, 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 the economic benefits, uh, we, uh, we are able to supply that, that the, the genotyping tool, their, their chip to our customers at a price of about $20 per sample. That is a much lower price than has been um, available in the market up until now. So you know, we're kind of thinking of 50 to 80% improvement on the price of uh, other uh, similar chips. And it, it, it gives us a number of advantages in the population uh, that we're breeding. Um, it's, it's designed for, um, for coverage within populations and for use across populations because it's gener in general use across a, a large number of, of, of breeding programs, we could keep our prices relatively low. Um, it's, it's used in a number of different ways. It's used for different ways in which we use genomics to make, to control breeding and in, inbreeding in populations, to manage the structure of breeding populations and, and provide uh, genomic information about selecting uh, the animals, the shrimps for improved performance. And uh, it, it gives us long-term use in terms of a platform that we will continue to develop and use for, for shrimp breeding um, as, we, as we move forward with, with different traits and different measurements that we're gonna use for breeding. So I think um, it's, 
it's a collaborative approach. I think that is 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 useful. I think we'll see that evolution in shrimp. Now we've seen it now, and we'll see that in other species in the future, where we we share uh, the use of this technology across a, a different a number of different frames of aquatic animals, and I think that gives us uh, cost benefit uh, in terms of uh, being able to do more genotyping, more breeding for for more traits in in different uh, breeding programs. Um, I should acknowledge a number of different people that have contributed to this presentation, um, and. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alan. Great presentation. And for the audience, please don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box. Our last speaker is Mitchell Lucas. Mitchell is the lead geneticist for American Penaid, better known as SAPI. They operate a commercial shrimp breeding program and supply farmers with SPF seed stocks. Mitch is, is a graduate of the Genetics, Genomics, and Bioinformatics PhD program at the University of California, Riverside. He's a population geneticist with professional experience in breeding and variety development. The title of his presentation is a Breeding Strategy for Emerging Needs in Shrimp Production. Mitch. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, perfect. I will start. My name is Mitch Lucas. I'll present a breeding strategy for some different emerging needs in shrimp production. Uh, I work for American Panaid. We own a farm in Southwest Florida. It's not a normal farm, it's a breeding center. So we spend a lot of money on feed and biosecurity. And this is all an effort to preserve our SPF status and distribute the healthiest, best animals possible to shrimp farmers and hatcheries around the world. So what is it that we do and what do we offer? So in different seed stock solutions include SPF broodstock. We've shipped over a million animals in the last few years to hatcheries around the world. There's a photo of a acclimation, a hatchery acclimation of a, a Vaname individual there on the right. We also sell specific pathogen-free post larvae. We distribute over a hundred million animals, typically 50 million per year. So we're a seed stock supplier first, that's what we do. We also have a lot of genetic diversity that we're using and partnering with people with similar long-term visions in the shrimp industry to breed specific varieties for their needs. So uh, yes, we sell brood stock. These are commercially available animals. They've been trialed and tested over years in different seasons and different locations. We have a lot of faith in them. They uh, have a general adaptability, they do quite well. Um, but I was just searching the chat and I'm already seeing questions. Um, how do I grow shrimp or which shrimp do I grow in my zero salinity pond? That's one example. Shrimp are marine, this is not normal. Uh, you also hear people talking about uh, growing indoors in these stacked raceways. This is not normal for a shrimp. They're used to living in muddy waters where they can't see each other. They bury down. And so there's still a lot of effort in domestication and intensive breeding to select these different types of shrimp for all these different environments. So that would really be the role of the custom genetic programs is to access our genetic diversity and selectively breed animals for a particular environment. So that'll be the focus of my talk. And so we built our own genetics lab. I think we're one of the very few breeding companies that owns its own germplasm. So we're able to supply animals and we own our own genetics lab. It's not outsourced. This has a big impact uh, for our program. So here's some pictures of the equipment. Uh, it's uh, SNP genotyping similar to what Alan was talking about, but with some different technology. Um, I've used this technology in the past. I've used chips. I've used genotyping by sequencing. We chose this approach for some very good reasons, but it's extremely automated and quick. So we run a farm and PLs need to go out the door and animals need to be transferred. And I don't have time to make ultra high quality DNA and sift through mountains of sequencing data. I need it quick. Um, I've seen this approach work in other industries. And so it's just, uh, it's an industrial scale of genotyping. So we extract DNA, there's liquid handling involved uh, to dispense the DNA and the PCR primers. 
We use water baths for amplification to look at our SNP targets. Uh, spectrophotometry is used to read the results. You can see they're under quality control, these three different clusters. So uh, this is looking at the fluorescence intensities at these alleles for all those different individuals. And then finally, we apply that data to population genetics. And so here's a quick video I'm gonna try playing of uh, the Nexar. So this is a liquid handler, the red plate is 384 well plate containing DNA. It's dispensing 700 nanoliters all at the same time. And then I walk down and over here you can see it's dispensing master mix and primers and non-contact dispense. So it's extremely automated, all barcoded. These are tied to physical animals on a farm that need to be moved and managed in a matter of days. And so it's very much application oriented uh, phenotyping. So using this technology, you get a lot of throughput. We extract um, DNA from up to 10,000 animals per day. Looking at PCR reactions, we're performing 80,000 reactions per day. You see a photo of me there with a lot of these spools of reaction wells behind me. It represents probably 10 million um, individual PCR reactions on over a million different animals in the last few months. So extremely high throughput, all to support breeding. So the question is, well, what do you do with this? And what impact has this had on your program? Because we've had this lab now for over three years. We've applied it to our animal and used it for strategic mating there. We've also gone out and sampled the domesticated shrimp uh, diversity that's out there. We went to the grocery stores. You buy shrimp from there. You can run their DNA. You can visit hatcheries and farms all across the world. So. For me, one of the biggest impacts is that we have organized genetics. And if you look, there's a bunch of different colored dots. Each dot's a different shrimp individual. The colors are assigned by population structure, and we're visualizing it on a principal component analysis. So if I play the video, you see we have all these different groups. And uh, we name our families or these lineages after states. So for example, the yellow one up there is Maine. The green one is Kansas, the teal one is Wyoming. So at any time I can go onto our farm and say, I need these yellow manes mated with these green Tennessees. That's the variety that I wanna trial. This is the population we're developing. So having this access to this organized genetics really sets us up for a custom genetic program. And so once you have organized genetics, and you have a particular environment, for example, in the chat, when we heard about the zero salinity, um, how can you breed for that? Uh, should we, we shouldn't expect the feed companies to come up with the perfect feed all on their own and genetics just stays the same. I think genetics has an equal part to play in bringing success to the farmers. So what we do is we've applied the SNP te technology, we've organized our individuals into different genetic pools, and this is kind of the generic strategy. So if you have a, a specific environment you want to breed for, this is part of the work we do in a custom program. So we supply you with two distinct broad lineages, essentially a designated male pool and a designated female pool. Um, I know the traits of those individuals, their pedigrees are DNA fingerprinted, and we supply that to your grow out environment. And over the course of a few years, we allow those to intermate. So males with males, females with females within the female pool. We perform DNA sampling, we study their performance and we selectively breed them to produce stable parents, stable parental lines from which we breed to make hybrids. And I can tell you, we've tried a lot of different things since I've joined the program, shipping out pure lines, shipping out hybrids, shipping out mixed individuals, and the hybrids have a huge impact on the performance of shrimp. So I'm not talking about hybrids between different species. Within the same species, hybrids created from different families. So you're essentially eliminating inbreeding and you have the ability to reproduce successful genetics. So this is a summary of the breeding strategy. So let's look closely at the optimization. That's an important phase. So consider 
this to be five different families or varieties in your male pool. So one, two, three, four, five, let's say you put them all in the same pond and you wanna know who did best. Well, shrimp from, this, from different families largely look the same. You can't just tell them apart visually. And um, so what we do is the, the SNP fingerprinting, the DNA technology, and that helps us assign individuals to families. So if I have this pond with five different varieties, and I say, well, what is the proportion of these different families at different time points? So PL, post larvae. So you can see at the beginning, the red variety, there's 850, 855 post larvae counted. They came from that family. You can deduce what proportion of the tank that that family makes up. So it'd be 17.6%. And you could come back and do the exact same thing at the adult stage. Uh, so now you see that that first family variety one, the red one now represents 18% of the tank at the adult stage. If you calculate the change in proportion, just by subtracting them, you can see their and understand their relative survival. So in this example, I really like family four. This is why farmers buy API seed stock is because we're known for survival. We focus our selection on survival. So in this case, um, I'd be most interested in breeding with the yellow variety. I had 110% relative survival compared to the under, other individuals in that tank. So this is a, a example of a survival study. This is how we breed. Um, and so, one commercial product that's come out of this is our Dragon line. It's made a big impact uh, since we launched it in 2021. It's really changing the lives of farmers. Um, it's, it, it was bred for survival. It keeps that legacy that we're known for, um, but it does have improved fecundity and improved uniformity over our standard uh, commercial hybrid. And this was developed using this genetic uh, uh, process that I described. We send out diversity, we screen it using our lab, we selectively breed, and we come out with a new product. So the dragon lion would be one example. But I wonder what's next. Um, you think of shrimp farming, you hear survival and growth. And yes, that's true and it should be major targets, but I wonder what else could be um, impacted from this genetic work. So you know, I'm thinking uh, if you're a large farmer or a large hatchery and you're not happy with your genetics and you want to try something different and you don't see the genetic companies coming onto your farm and collecting samples and data, then uh, you're welcome to partner with us. We supply you with diverse genetics. We supply you with commercial genetics. We perform this DNA sampling uh, technology and we essentially will breed animals based on results from your farm. Um, so you could partner with us for that. We'd supply it as uh, specific pathogen-free seed stocks. Uh, so we're looking at large farms, large hatcheries, uh, feed companies. So you hear a lot, what are some of the emerging trends? Um, uh, alternative feeds, alternative protein sources, uh, feed companies always pushing the envelopes. Shouldn't the genetic component also be pushed? Um, couldn't we partner? to breed a variety of shrimp that is optimized for your new feed ingredient. I think that would be incredibly interesting and could make a big impact. Also breeding programs, if you're seeing your stocks crash or you're worried about inbreeding or you need a new trait, a new source of variation, this is a way that you can access new germplasm in a legal and safe way. If you just go and buy commercial animals and start breeding them with them, it's uh, not designed to work that way. Uh, we supply seed stocks that are strategically bred to give the most impact on the first generation. So to access broader genetics and really build your breeding program, it might be wise to access some more pure lines that are more uh, better organized. So you can see, it's just kind of a fun video there on the right. So of course, uh, we could breed for feed. Uh, you could breed for different salinities, um, different daylights, um, different water qualities. But I wonder about color. Um, I think the veterans here would quickly realize the shrimp on the left 
has not molted yet. The shrimp on the right has molted. But I wonder, is there some way that we can breed a shrimp using this genetic diversity that has color bred into it? All else being equal, a variety of shrimp that can sequester um, nutrients from the feed and express that as pigmentation on the skin. So here's a quick video. These shrimp were grown in the same pond. They were harvested and placed on ice about two hours before this video. Uh, so you can see the shrimp on the left is much lighter in color than the shrimp on the right. It's very dark. And I'm about to submerge them in boiling water. And try and pay attention to the color, particularly to the dark shrimp on the right. I would keep my eye on that. And so you can see this really immediate and impressive color change. Being, I'm not a shrimp connoisseur, but being a general consumer, I really want that dark red shrimp. I wanna know how can I breed that? How can I have all of my shrimp come out like that? This is what I wanna purchase at the grocery store. And is there something that we can do on the genetic side of things to deliver uh, this quality of shrimp product? It's just a quick example of some of the variation that we see in our stocks and what's accessible if you access uh, diverse genetics. And so to learn more about our seed stocks and breeding program, uh, that's American Panead is the company, panead.com. Um, our farm also sells uh, shrimp for meat. It's a premium shrimp that's uh, peeled and deveined, vacuum packed and sealed. You can buy this online at sunshrimp.com, but it essentially all comes from our same farm. Okay, that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you all for the great presentations. I would like to ask our panelists to turn on their videos to begin the, the Q&A session. So let's start with Jeff, here's a question for you. What is the relationship between fast growing feed and stress? One moment, let me turn on your video. Yes, I'm uh, trying, I'm also trying to get the big screen again. Right. One moment. Okay, can you, because I've, uh, I've lost uh, my screen, you can see me? Yeah, it's okay. okay. The question, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, what is the relationship between fast growing feed and stress? The relation between fast growing feed and stress. There is actually, I don't see a uh, relation between getting the shrimp under stress because they are fast growing. You're actually, you, uh, if, you if you have uh, shrimp which are prepared to grow fast and you treat them right and you give them the right nutrition, I think actually the stress reducing. Now, if you ask in stress in another way, should uh, fast growing shrimp be less stressful at the end of the rearing cycle so that they are more uh, apt to be transferred to the nursery or to the grow out ponds? So yes, we have seen that, we have seen that, we've seen results. So more robust shrimp, faster growing shrimp, which in this case are also happen to be robust, they have uh, a better performance at the farm. Well, thank you. Ricardo, there were a couple of questions on the administration of liquid feeds. Uh, this liquid feed is supplementary or a complete feed for larvae? And should, should it be mixed in water before administration? Okay, uh, the, the liquid life uh, products are designed uh, to be a complete feed, can be used from the start of the uh, culture until the harvest. So the uh, we don't, um, regarding the second question, we don't recommend the mix of the product with any additive or, or, or component because we can affect the stability of the microcapsulate. So the, uh, we recommend to apply in different uh, times the different products to the tank of the culture. Okay, thank you. Alan, here's a question for you. Can we have a small array designed to identify the traits promised by the Brewstock supplier? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the panel that we have is designed to go across uh, a large number of different, um, a, a large number of different strains. 
the, the ability to check within the strain is interesting. So you have to have uh, the original material and your own material to be able to check that you see the sim a similar association across um, that that individual strain. Um, I, I think I, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that, it, it, that unless you have major genes affecting the trait, that you could go and then test out the prediction that, that, that individual breeders would have. I don't think that's the way that you, you would best be able to do the, the, the test. If, if, you want to, if you want to check the prediction of performance of a particular strain and, 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 and animals that are coming from a, from a particular supplier, the best way to do that is in a control um, study of your own where you're, you grow uh, animals in your either your own production system or, or a, a trial that, that mocks up your own production system and you look for um, the, the the performance in that environment I think I think predictions sometimes are difficult to go across environments that the predictions are made for specific environments at a, at a particular time so um, I, I, I don't think it's, it's the, the routine use of of genotyping to make predictions as a quality control level is particularly useful, but there are ways of doing that by, by setting up appropriate trials and, and measurements in your own production system, or even a third party where you, you might want to uh, pay for uh, studies to be done where in, in small groups where you can measure performance accurately at the level of individual. Okay, thank you. Mitch, here's a question for you. What do you consider a large farm? For the genetics samples, will you travel to different countries or the samples are sent to your facility in Florida? And what are the requirements to become a partner? Good question. We do travel to collect the samples. Um, we have a unique technology I didn't present today, but a way of getting DNA safely and securely out of countries without freezing them and shipping them on dry ice. Um, so we collect, our breeding programs run based on production ponds. Uh, so this is normal for us, it's standard. Um, we roughly charge $6 per sample for these type of genotyping projects. It depends on how many samples you're sending and if you're an uh, existing broodstock customer of ours. Um, in terms of size, I mean, it really needs to be matching our minimum animal shipment. So are you willing to purchase a thousand brood stock at a time? Um, outside of that, yeah, I mean, it's a case by case scenario and who we'd want to partner with, but we are open and willing to send an email and we can work on a specific project. Okay, thank you. Can, Jeff? I, can, I, just make, yep. can I just make a comment there just about, I mean, it's, it's not common for samples to be frozen for DNA extraction. And uh, I think that that transport and movement of samples around the world is commonly done. There are a number of ways of doing that. It's not routine to freeze it. Um, there, are, there are safe and easy and cheap ways of moving a large number of samples around that's common technology that, that most genotyping companies would employ. And, and, and certainly there are opportunities uh, to get testing done um, without having to freeze samples. Okay, thank you. Jeff, uh, another question for you. I want to know how genetic on shrimp, how the genetics on shrimp is related with fast growing. The genetics on shrimp is related to fast growing because if you buy it's actually it's more, uh, it's more for, the, for, the, for the genetic guys. But okay, so genetics on shrimp, uh, it's partly like I said in, in, the, in the beginning, so it starts with the genetics. You have a potential of very fast growth or of normal growth, and that is through genetic selection. Then, of course, you have your management, which will facilitate whether your larvae will grow right. You need, for example, you need oxygen. So you need to be careful that you have to take care of the oxygen is good there and the rest of the management, uh, biosecurity, whatever. And then, of course, you have your feet. So, uh, and everything will contribute to the, to the, to the, to the, fast, to the fast growth, but for the genetic part, I'll gladly let one of the genetic guys over here elaborate on the answer. I, I can comment on that. I think, I mean, across many animal species, growth is a 
is is high, is highly heritable. It means that the the variation that we see in a production environment, the variation we see uh, between different animals, is largely associated with genetics. About thirty percent uh, of the genetic of the variation that we see is down to the genetics. Uh, growth has been used across a number of different species as a, as a straightforward. Uh, Me method of measuring performance and then choosing the fastest growing animals to improve performance. That's done commonly in many species um, and uh, that becomes more sophisticated if you begin to take family structures in place and, and begin to use genotyping as has been described in two of the talks earlier on today. So there is a high level of, of, of genetic inheritance of growth um, that it requires individual measurement of growth and, and identif identification of those animals that are growing quickly. Um, and often it differs between different environments. So the fastest growing individuals in one environment may not be the fastest growing indiv individuals in another environment. That we call that genotype or environment interaction. It may, basically means that in, in some environments, uh, animals of one particular genetics grow well and in another particular don't grow well and vice versa when we move them across in farms. We can deal with that easily within a, a pedigree program where we have the family structure and we can test animals in the two different environments and look for balanced improvement in growth where we're looking for those animals that are growing fast in both environments. And, and that's now again commonplace in, in many uh, aquatic species and, and, and would also work effectively in shrimp breeding. And I know of several situations where companies are breeding companies are using that approach to select for improved performance across a range of environments. Okay, thank you. Ricardo, here is a question for you. Considering the digestive issues or with PLs, does the gel encapsulation reduce digestibility from the embedded nutrients? Uh, Normally, we recommend to use a, 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 a gel a product with nerve characteristics, so to do don't, don't affect the 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 palatability of the feed, and uh, we should not expect to have uh, some uh, problem in digestibility using products similar like gelatin or something in the microcapsule. Okay, thank you. Alan, here's a question for you. How long does it uh, take typically to take to put together a collaborative array? Yeah, and that's an interesting question. It, it, it depends. Well, the, the short answer is one of the short answers is it depends how collaborative people are. If, if we spend a lot of time trying to find the samples from different populations, then that can take a long time. The collaboration can take a long time. But once we have the samples in, um, it, it's you know, a few months to be able to do the analysis, the genotyping, and then the analysis, and then um, focus in on the on the the, the the SNPs that are most useful within the population. So, so an analysis looking at maybe you know several hundred thousand potential candidate SNPs, bringing that down to a, a, a number that we can we find useful. So, so, we, so say fifty k, that that can take only that only takes a few months. It, it probably takes longer to negotiate with people to get the samples into the lab than it does to do the to do the analysis. But we can we can be quite quick in developing new sets of of, um, of panels for use uh, by by clients. Okay, thank you, Mitch. Uh, here's another question: Have the nutritional requirements such as protein, energy for api dragon line been determined? Sorry, I don't understand. If the nutritional requirements for the Apple Dragon line have been determined. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. As a seed stock supplier, we're sending brood stock out to all over the world, different feeds, different water qualities. Dragon line was one that rose above the others in terms of broad adaptability. It is not, I don't have a recipe for you on Dragon Line on what the feeds are. It, we did not partner with a specific feed company and optimize the feed for Biomar or Cargill liquid feed. Uh, that's not what was done. So I don't have a recipe for Dragon Line. It's just one that had broad adaptability. It's like the starting point for stable genetics. And beyond that, 
yes, I'd be interested in developing a line that's optimized for these other feeds, but that is currently not a requirement for growing dragon. Okay, good. Jeff, here's another question. How much of the fast growth feed do you give to the total amount of feed? You're muted. Well, the, the idea is so whatever whatever results I've presented, they were given with 100% uh, uh, fast growth feed. So from nurse, that is going from from now play five till PL till PL eight or PL twelve, whatever whatever is necessary. We have done trials in Mexico. I think they're in my presentation of last year. We've done trials in Mexico where we test uh, our feeds alone or where we test the fast growth feeds alone or we test the fast growth in fast growth feed in a mix together with other feeds. And uh, we see we see that the, the, the potential gets a bit lost. Uh, I imagine the potential gets lost because you get unbalanced. So if you have one feed which is completely balanced, so you, you, you if you give it next to another feed, suddenly you get nutrients which are unbalanced. And another explanation I might think of that if you give it, for example, with another feed from a another feed which might be, for example, a cheap feed, because typically in these mixes they also put one cheap feed at 30, 40 percent of the mix. So, for example, if they, if for example, in this cheap feed you have a cheap ingredient of low quality, which actually brings down uh, growth, you bring down the growth of the whole uh, of the whole mix. So, I would not recommend mixing it. I would not recommend mixing feeds. No. Okay, thank you. Ricardo, can liquid feeds achieve the nutritional levels to totally replace live feed? Um, okay, we don't we don't have a, a, a liquid diet designed to, to cover all the all the to replace all the uh, live feed. Uh, we uh, recommend the use for the complete cycle, but uh, also recommend the inclusion of uh, another feeds like microalgae and artemia in the in the culture. Thank you. Alan, how often do you expect for collaborative arise to be updated? I think, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think um, new technologies is, 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 is coming along all the time and, and new methods of, of, of carrying out analysis is, is coming along. I think we've seen the development of new chip panels probably on a, about a three to five year basis. Um, with the major species that they're using. So every three to five years, the, the panel is updated and, and, new, and new SNPs or new markers are brought into the panel and as often associated with a new generation of, of, of technology to be able to read the, the panels. I think we're getting to the stage now where that may be uh, stabilizing, that, that, that we have routine panels now for you know, 50 to 60,000 SNPs in, in many species. Uh, and, and adding more SNPs when you have that level of coverage doesn't give you that much more of an advantage. There is there are diminishing returns there in, in, in adding more uh, SNPs markers to the panel. You don't get any further increase in accuracy, so it's debatable whether you need to keep adding those 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 further SNPs. What does change, however, are um, are is there the research that's looking for major genes. And as, as more and more research is done and we find more association between uh, markers for a particular gene on the chromosome, a major gene on the chromosome or QTL, major QTL, then adding those in becomes important. That They may be on the panel already, but, but if they're not on the panel, then we should we should adapt that, adapt the panel and include those in. So I think, uh, we you know we should expect to see regular updating of, of the panel, uh, and, and, I, and I think probably on a three to five year basis is is is, is reasonable. Uh, but you know it also depends on the new technologies coming in. If, there, if there's a new technology for reading uh, those number of SNPs, it's more cost effective. Then we may we may adapt to panels more frequently than that. Okay, thank you, Mitch. Do shrimp experience inbreeding depression? Great question. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's people, scientists that have built their careers on this. Uh, yes, I can say that from our hybrid breeding program, we've seen a huge impact on fecundity and uniformity. 
survival doesn't seem to be impacted as much. Growth doesn't seem to be impacted as much. But the immediate things that are just glaring at us from pursuing hybrids are fecundity and uniformity. Um, yep. Thank you. And yeah, so okay. people have made their career on this. I'm sorry to just elaborate, especially when shrimp are larger and they're under disease stress environments, inbred shrimp perform poorly. This is a consensus. Thank you. Jeff, how good is the salinity stress to determine the larval quality? You're muted, Jeff. I keep on doing this, I'm sorry. Uh, this related to some other questions uh, that I've seen in the Q uh, Q&A uh, session. So how good is salinity stress test? It is just a test to, uh, to evaluate quality. You should never use any one test to evaluate quality to determine the total quality of your shrimp. There is much more than just a salinity stress test. The origin of the salinity stress test was a uh, long time ago when people were still catching uh, wild coast larvae. They would have loads of bycatch, small fish larvae, starfish larvae, whatever. To separate the shrimp from the other animals, they would add fresh water to kill off all the bycatch and just stay there with the strong and the good vaname, and that one would be, would be transported to the farm. Then it has been in, in, uh, turn, uh, transformed into a test, and it is actually useful. It's useful to see how it's an, an indicator, first and foremost, of the osmotic capacity regulation of the branchiae of the shrimp. So are the branchiae, branchiae big enough for the shrimp to be able to survive in the, in the, in the farm? But then there's loads of other stuff that you have to look at. For example, microscopic evaluation. You have to look at the shrimp under the microscope when everything is developed. For example, the branchia, you also look whether the branchia are, are sufficiently lobalized, whether they are developed, whether the hepatopancreas is nicely and defined, whether the intestine is defined, whether the shrimp are eating, it's also important. The, like I mentioned in the, the thing that uh, the, the, the cleanliness of the exoskeleton is important. So there's loads of other stuff that is important. Something I wanted to mention, there's something much difficult, for example, this observation, is sometimes you see feeds with a very dark color being given. If you give these feeds with a very dark color, you can't actually see the hepatopancreas. You can't see the definition of the hepatopancreas of the tubules inside because everything is black. You can't see whether the intestine, whether some of the... the the peritrophic membrane is peeling off. You can't see it because everything is black. So I don't like normally. I don't like these feet. I like a feet which is a bit, a bit, a bit, uh, a bit more clear. But yes, don't use any one test. Use a lot of tests. Loads of observation. Look whether your larvae are active. If you tap the bucket, are they are they uh, jumping? A small countercurrent test. Uh, move the, the water in in a, in a in a tray a bit and look whether they start swimming countercurrent. Do loads of tests. Don't rely on anyone single test. Okay, thank you. Ricardo, how does the lower level of protein content in liquid versus dry feeds have an effect on larval growth? You're muted. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, normally, we have a, a lower level of, of protein included in our diets, but uh, this uh, uh, also, we have a, a higher inclusion of uh, amino acids uh, into the formulation, so we can uh, cover all the uh, nutritional requirements of the animals and, in, and also uh, reduce the impact of the nitrogen in the water quality. Okay, thank you. Alan, how frequently breeders should need to be genotyped? Is it required for each breeding cycle? I think in in high in in well developed advanced breeding programs where we're relying on genomic selection, uh, then the breeders need to be genotyped each generation. So so we're going through a cycle of of uh, following the family performance and, and genotyping is used now in many programs to to follow the family structure, uh, and then it's also used. Uh, in this process, I would describe as genomic selection, where where we use markers associated with uh, performance uh, across the uh, the genome to predict performance of individuals based on on test performances of, of their relatives in different production systems. That relies fundamentally on having genotypes for each of the individuals. 
that you that you select. Um, when you move into multiplication, which is is, is an area where uh, you're taking animals from the, the from the, uh, the 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 highest level breeding program and multiplying those animals up for use in in commercial production, it's not then absolutely required that you and those individuals because they tend to be selected from a a group of it, uh, of animals that already have high uh, levels of, of testing and prediction and, 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 and are animals that, that have high level of genetic performance. And, and you can multiply that in, them up through the generations um, to give you the, 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 the grow out numbers, the, the, the PLs that you need for commercial production. Although some people are considering that, you know, that, that they find a benefit in being able to do selection within that population to give them even more uh, genetic improvement. So. Within a within a pedigree breeding program, yes, advanced programs are now testing uh, animals using genotyping each generation. Uh, in multiplication programs, it's not absolutely necessary, but it but it might give some advantages um, in particular traits. Okay, thank you, Mitch. Why has it taken seed companies so long to offer farmers different varieties of shrimp? Yeah, good question. I think it's a lot of points to make there. I think one is the limited domestication history. People haven't been breeding shrimp for that long. Uh, that's one part of it. I think the biggest aspect is that it's so difficult to trial new genetics. So if I give you, for example, going back to my talk, if I give you five different varieties and you're a farmer and I ask you, which one do you want again? This is my interest as a seed stock company. Give you what you want, what worked on your farm. If I give you five varieties, how are you gonna test them? Historically, this has been done in isolation. So variety one and pond one, variety two and pond two, you need five ponds. You hope there's no environmental variation between the ponds, um, but we know that there is. And so it becomes inefficient to test so many genetics. So I think this is a big part of why it's taken so long is just the aspect of trialing. You know, there's a lot of environments to grow them in. Um, and so, now with the DNA technology, we're able to combine multiple families into the same pond and really streamline the trialing with new genetics. But all five varieties in the same pond perform DNA testing to understand which variety to breed again. Okay, thank you. What is, Jeff, what is more important to achieve good results, genetics, management, or nutrition? I'm mute. You're muted again. Sorry. Um, so uh, again, this also related to, to again to another uh, to another to another question. So Bo, oh, uh, there was one. Yeah, there was one question by Diogo also, which kind of says this, and he talks about data, the availability of data, of of production data. Um, to see what is more important, genetic genetics, the management or nutrition. Um, genetics, of course, it is it is important. Do we have? Um, uh, let me. Sorry, I'm going again. I would say in the environment or in the man, in the management, the most important thing is oxygen. So you need to have a lot uh, enough oxygen in your tank, so that you, your animals will survive. More than anything, you need oxygen. Then you can think, think start thinking about having good animals, good quality animals, genetically selected or not. And then you, uh, of course, you have to facilitate that that uh, selection with the rest of the good management and with a feed, which realizes that potential in the in the shrimp. So that is very important. Um, the data, uh, Diogo, um, as as you will know, in the field there, there there's a bit. Sometimes it's very difficult to get data. First, people don't want to give their data. <laughs> because they, they think it's it's proprietary it's very it's very they, they protect their data or maybe they are afraid that if they show good data that the feed companies will raise the price of the of the larvae can be i don't know secondly there's a lot of variation in the field that's why we do experiment in controlled conditions so to take away this variation and to really look at the effects that we want to look at uh, in a field you have loads of other effects which come into play and uh third Thirdly, uh, production production data. So what happens if, for example, you have a product that functions or a protocol which functions and you test in a production environment, the farmer 
sees it is functioning, functioning and he will switch all his tanks to that protocol. So you lose your control. So it becomes really difficult to get, to get those data. That being said, we do see, for example, uh, differences. We can quantify it, but we can quantify it by hatchery. We see hatcheries that use and genetic selection and that we know have a very advanced uh, management with high temperatures and that are using good quality feeds. And we can distinguish it uh, from another hatchery where, for example, they don't use that advanced as a genetic selection. They do use a good management, but maybe they don't go that high as a temperature. They don't really force the animals to molt at that high temperature, but they are giving feed that realizes, that can realize all the growth potential in the shrimp. We can see that they still advance, not as much, not as much as the six days that we saw before, but they can advance or the, the, the growth cycle with two days. So it is quantifiable. It is difficult, but you have to look for it, but it is quantifiable with production data from the field. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. What's next in the future of liquid feed nutrition for hatcheries? Can they be used in larval cultures or, for example, in grazer animals? Yeah, we have. A, uh, we're looking for a, a automatization, autom automatization systems, automated syst automatic systems in the production hatch in the hatcheries, so we can uh, improve the performance of the liquid diets. Uh, we are also. Uh, and made some tests in Mexico using these uh, liquid feeds in nurseries, so with a little more bigger animals and with good results and, and less impact in the in water quality also in these uh, uh, maternities or, or nurseries, as they, as they mentioned. Uh, with, we believe that uh, the use of uh, new functional additive will improve the performance of the animals in the farm after the hatcheries. So I, I, we, I think we, we have to, to invest in the development of, of new uh, functional diets uh, to be applied uh, from the beginning in the, in the hatcheries until the, until the most largely ready farm. Okay, good. Alan, how confident are you that you can build a collaborative array for a new species that works broadly across all breeding populations? It's been done several times um, in different species. Uh, the, the array we have developed is for um, for shrimp is, is is now up and operational, and I think has you know, has a large number of clients using that routinely now for for monitoring their populations, both at a level of doing uh, population management, inbreeding control, um, diversity uh, management within the population, and also using it for family studies. Um, and for genomic selection. So I think, I think I won't say it's routine technology, uh, but I would say it, the technology is, is well worked out and, and, and provided there is not a huge diversity between different strains um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the species, then we should be able to develop a, a, a chip that has, um, that, it, that can be used across uh, uh, the different, the different the different strains. So I'm, 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 I'm very confident. Um, I'm not aware of there being issues in any particular strains that we've dealt with. So any particular species we've dealt with up until now, and and the, the evidence from other species, both terrestrial and aquatic species, says that that we should be able to put together a, a chip that works, um, and and supply people with a, a tool that works across those different populations. Okay. Thank you. And one last question to Mitch that's uh, probably come up. Is the resistance to DIV1 part of the gene detection should do? No, I do not use a perfect marker for DIV1. Okay. And now a last question because we have already have 30 minutes of the Q&A. Um, yesterday we discussed how um, disease outbreaks were facing the Asian hatchery farmers. Now, today we would like to ask all the panelists about Latin America. Ecuador shrimp production has increased in the past few years and the country is moving to a more intensified production. So I would like to ask you, how do you see hatcheries are facing this change and if there's room for improvements in terms of feeds and genetics? Ricardo, you are in Ecuador. How do you see this change? Yes, uh, we are. Uh, uh... 
uh, will have a, a higher demand of polarbis in these uh, last uh, months. Um, and we are expecting uh, to have the capacity to respond this demand uh, uh, using uh, uh, increasing densities or using uh, new technologies to support the, the, the high stock in densities that we would need to use to, to cover the demand. So the, it's important to have a high quality feeds, um, fast, fast growing feeds, as Jeff mentioned also, uh, to be uh, to be to to sustain this this need of the industry. So the only only exit of the of the farm start in the hatcheries. So if we use a high quality feeds, we can assure the results in the in the farms. But uh, is. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, is there are three pillars: uh, genetic, nutrition, and also the technology and the biosecurity production systems. With all these three pillars, we can uh, be confident that, that we can sustain the growth of the industry in the next years. Okay, thank you, Jeff. But well, we're seeing a, we're seeing quite a big shift in, in Ecuador in the, the post larval core production, and, and Ricardo can can uh, can probably say that also. We're seeing uh, a shift, for example, farmers, they are actually asking for big post larvae. They are asking for animals where you have animal counts where you have 200 PL per gram. And they want these animals to be grown up to that size in a short, uh, in a short time. So we see also a bit a demand. We see also farms um, compilating uh, data on uh, how the performances of different hatcheries in the farm and going back to the farms that actually to the, to the hatcheries that actually supply uh, good quality post larvae. We see also a big consolidation of the hatchery industry in Ecuador. So you see very hatcheries getting very big. So going from loads of small hatcheries to really going very technified big hatcheries that really produce quality post larvae that have records on anything and that are actually wanting to invest in better feeds, in good genetics, uh, in all these things. So it's really a very interesting evolution that we're seeing in Ecuador. And what I really like from that evolution is an evolution towards the delivery of big and quality post larvae to the farms. So they are stepping away from the cheap uh, junk post larvae and really going for quality post larvae because they see that they get nice results in the farms with those post larvae. Okay, Alan. Um, I'm not going to answer the question for um, Ecuador, but what I'm going to say is that farming in all of its aspects and, and all of its situations is about management of disease. There is always a new disease capable of evolving and finding a space to, to work in the production environment. And, and we've seen that in human populations recently with, with COVID, a new disease evolving and having a big effect on the population. So farming is about dealing with disease in many different ways. So expect there to be new diseases. I've used the phrase um, TLD in the past. The next disease, disease is a, is a, is a three-letter disease. It's always a three-letter disease, except when it's got four letters. Um, and, and over my time in farming industries, I've seen these three-letter diseases coming in waves in different, in different situations. Can we improve the genetics? Of course we can improve the genetics. We can always improve the genetics. What we need to do is put in place um, phenotyping measurements of animals and populations and use that information in tested technologies and, and breeding, and we will be able to make uh, improvements and resistant to that disease. So that identifying these diseases, new diseases as they come along, putting in place challenge studies, doing the genetics behind that and then applying the genetics and, and breeding programs um, and around. Genetics is not the only tool. Um, development of, 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 of uh, uh, health systems, development of new feeds, development of new additives, pharmaceuticals, all have a role to play. Um, but genetics is, is one of the been used to, to make improvements. Um, and and you know, my anticipation is that, that we will continue to see these challenges as we continue to farm animals. And, and genetics is a tool that we can use to to deal with that as, as new challenges come along. Okay, thank you. Meech? I'm impressed with Ecuador. They own their genetics. It's one of the few countries where I see 
uh, farmers taking control of what they depend on, their livelihoods, the genetic programs. I've been extremely impressed with some of the Ecuadorian genetic programs that I've seen. And it's very much unlike India, who I think has a lot of potential, but that's where I think they differ. I've seen Ecuador come and own genetic programs. It's not headline breaking technology of sequencing and all this, it's farm application oriented breeding programs. And so for me, that is part of the success I, from Ecuador can be attributed to that. And I'm impressed and I think it should be a model, uh, particularly for India and for other countries in Southeast Asia. Okay, thank you all. That wraps up the Q&A. For those questions that were not answered live, they will be answered by email. I would like to thank our speakers today, Jeff, Ricardo, Alan and Mitch for your time and the great presentations and to our sponsors, Cargill, and the Center for Aquaculture Technologies. And thanks everyone for joining in. The recording will be available on YouTube soon. Our next webinar will take place tomorrow at the same time. Don't miss the third session on fish, feeds, and genetics. And if you want to stay up to date on the latest news on aquaculture hatcheries, don't forget to subscribe for free to our publications on hatcheryfm.com. Take care, everybody, and see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Right.